we're going to be talking about today is the form that revolutionary organization should take and the prospects and perspectives that we're using to build it. Um, this kickoff is going to attempt to sketch an outline of the ways that capitalism maintains itself and how we have to organize ourselves to fight it, um, which will necessarily begin with some discussion of how capitalism shapes our ideas more broadly, um, and then end with specific strategic recommendations for Marxist working in the U.S. today. Um, I would recommend the comrades enjoy this lovely communist futurist image while it lasts. The slides to come will be rather less inspiring in form, if not in content. Um, so we're going to start off um, with a discussion of ideas. And for, for reasons that might get more clear once I get into the short and long-term prospects section, um, one of the main things that communists right now have to think about is what are our ideas? How do we put them forward? How do we develop them? How do we reach an audience? And then how do we organize around them? Um, so let's see if I can, there we go. So I want to start with a, with a quote that's probably familiar to a lot of people. Um, Marx from the German ideology says, the ideas of the ruling class are in every epoch the ruling ideas, i.e. the class which is the ruling material force of society is at the same time its ruling intellectual force. So comrades who were at the recent uh, Denver communists talk on uh, the labor aristocracy with Charlie Post, um, will remember there was some discussion um, of this quote, which we use a lot on the Marxist left, um, and which Post pointed out can become kind of a lazy shorthand, right? Um, it describes something that's true, right? The ruling ideas in any given society correspond to the interests of the class that materially rules that society. But if we have different ideas, we need to have a sense of how this happens um, and how we can push against it. So in the same text, Marx also argues that the existence of revolutionary ideas in a particular period presupposes the existence of a revolutionary class. So if we have developed revolutionary ideas, we know that there is some kind of class corresponding to those ideas, right? In whose interest those ideas are formed. Um, when Marxists say that social being determines consciousness, this is what we're talking about, right? Um, I think sometimes people who are newer to, to socialism get stuck on that word determines, right? As though social being automatically gives you a particular kind of consciousness. I think it's useful to think of this more in terms of the way that we exist together in society sets the limits of what kinds of consciousness are present. So on the one hand, we have the ruling ideas, they correspond to the ruling class. On the other hand, we have revolutionary ideas correspond to the working class and to which we're committed. So as far as how the ruling class maintains um, the, this hegemony of ideas, uh, Mick Armstrong in one of the readings for today says that there's a fairly simple explanation for it. Um, the owners of the means of production, the people who own factories and mines and offices also own the education system, the media, advertising, the courts, the government bureaucracy. All of these institutions that shape ideas and values are owned by the ruling class. Um, these are the sorts of institutions that, for example, Althusser called uh, ideological state apparatuses. Um, we don't have to, to agree with everything Althusser has to say to find that a fairly useful framework. Um, these are all of the things that shape the way we think. Um, this is what the old IWW folks called head fixin'. Um, some of the rebels in Paris in 1968 would refer to these ideas as the cop inside your head and in, invite you to kill it. Um, Marxists tend to refer to this as either ideology or false consciousness. But in, in any event, the, the, the simple ownership of the way that ideas are propagated um, helps ensure that those ideas are capitalist. Uh, but there is, I think, more to it. Uh, it's not just ideas being imposed on us from above. Um, so I want to take a little sidetrack into a somewhat underutilized concept um, in, in Marxist economics that I'm not gonna fully delve into. Um, but that is subsumption, which takes two forms, real and formal, according to Marx. Formal subsumption consists of when capitalism essentially seizes some other form of production. Um, 
whether it's just taking private ownership of the way that goods are produced and distributed and leaving everything else intact, or introducing kind of basic wage labor into a society that has non or pre-capitalist social formations dominating. Real subsumption consists of when capitalism is fully implemented, all of the, the, the um, process of production has become fully capitalist, that is, you know, propertyless wage laborers selling their labor as opposed to uh, subsistence farming or other forms of, of, of subsistence. Um, we see the development of the nuclear family as opposed to broader kinship networks or community forms. Um, and Marx says that the whole real shape of the mode of production changes uh, with the production of relative surplus value. A specifically capitalist mode of production arises. Um, and there also begins a simultaneous development of the relations of production corresponding to the capitalist production process. So capitalist production creates a capitalist relations of production. Um, and this has to do with things far beyond just the factory floor or the workplace, right? Relations of production permeate society, um, which Gramsci talks about. Um, I'm not gonna go through this whole the quote, um, but I think it's it's particularly useful um, where Gramsci points out that one might almost say that a working person has two consciousnesses or one contradictory consciousness. Um, one, which is implicit in his activity and which in reality unites him with all his fellow workers in the practical transformation of the real world. And one, superficially explicit or verbal, which he has inherited from the past and superficially absorbed. The same group has, for reasons of submission and intellectual subordination, adopted a conception verbally and believes itself to be following it because this is the conception it follows in normal times. This conception is what I refer to as capitalist ideas, right? Capitalist ideology. So with real subsum subsumption, with capitalism reshaping all of our relations to each other and to our work, um, and what Gramsci points out, um, the way that you sort of have to accept those ideas in normal times because everything you do as an individual under capitalism reinforces to you the normalcy of capitalism, right? If you're applying for a job, um, you see all the other working people applying for that job as your competition and not people um, in, with whom you can stand in solidarity, right? When the, cap, when the capitalist class bling, brings in, for example, uh, a popular practice in America, black strike breakers, um, to break a strike in a predominantly white area, this reinforces racist ideas, right? So, and 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 those are dramatic examples, but at every step along the way, right? And in addition to the uh, means of ideological reproduction that capitalism owns, it's also our way of life. The way we move through the world is conditioned by capitalism and reinforces um, an acceptance of capitalism. So where does that leave us? Um, that leaves us, in my opinion, with the fact that an individual cannot put forward um, anti-capitalist ideas in any kind of consistent or effective way. You need an organization, right? You need um, a revolutionary party. Uh, Lenin says, without revolutionary theory, there can be no revolutionary movement. This idea cannot be insisted upon too strongly at a time when the fashionable preaching of opportunism goes hand in hand hand with infatuation for the narrowest forms of practical activity. This should sound familiar to everybody here, right? Uh, anyone who's ever been in a political meeting where it's like, no, we don't need to read a fucking book. We just need to hit the streets, right? Um, why, would we, why would we debate these theoretical questions when there's something we have to do right now? This infatuation for the narrowest forms of practical activity is something that we need to be able to push against in a collective and organized way. Um, and this isn't just metaphorical, right? When we talk about the ideological class struggle, this isn't just, um, this isn't hyperbole, right? Lenin goes on to say that Engels recognizes not two forms of the great struggle of social democracy, political and economic, but three, placing the theoretical struggle on par with the first two. So theoretical struggle, political struggle, or, or um, ideological struggle is as much a part of the class war as political and economic struggles. So we we know that we have revolutionary ideas. We need organization to be able to develop them and project them effectively to maintain them against the constant assaults by capitalism. So what's our situation right now in which we're trying to do this? We have inherited and uh, 
well, and also participated in a badly disorganized radical left. Um, where more than more than uh, any time since I joined the radical left, um, the fragmentation, rapid dissolution of of radical organizations is is is, is higher than I remember. Um, we have small parties or small organizations, uh, the ISO, Socialist Alternative, IMT, just in just in within Trotskyism, um, Socialist Action, fragmenting or dissolving or splitting. Um, and leaving not much in their wake, right? We also have uh, a situation characterized by escalating capitalist crises. I list a few here, right? The ongoing economic crisis of neoliberalism, increasing inter-imperial rivalry, the rise of the far right, climate disaster. So we have a disorganized left, more problems than ever that we need an organized left to solve. And we do see a wide audience for socialist politics, but this audience is finding very few viable outlets. You know, with the failures of some of the traditional parties of revolutionary socialism or organizations of revolutionary socialism, I should say, um, there's not that many places for all of the, the young people who all these polls show overwhelmingly favor social or not overwhelmingly narrowly favor socialism to capitalism. Where do they go? How do we determine what they mean by that when they answer those polls that way? Um, and how do we find them? Right? Well, that leads us to the question of who our audience is. Right for trying to project these ideas as an organization, uh, Mick Armstrong in the the one of the readings um, says on the topic of the working class vanguard, there is no mass organization of radicals of any description, nor any significant current of politicized workers that revolutionaries can orient to. There are in every workplace a few workers who are active in the union or more left wing than most, but they do not form an organized layer that revolutionaries can relate to on an ongoing basis. So in the past, traditionally, when when Marxists have talked about like, oh, we need to like relate to the vanguard. They're talking about people involved in some of the mass organizations of the working class um, that, that Armstrong is correctly pointing out. Um, and it's only gotten more correct since his book was written, uh, doesn't exist anymore, right? Which creates a problem because when people begin to move politically, they look for leadership in the already existing vanguard. So if you're radicalizing, you look to who is the leadership of the left. You look to who is the leadership of social movements. You look to who is the most combative union presence. And if that doesn't exist for you to plug into, that creates a problem. Um, however, I would argue, in addition to what, what Armstrong says, that the working class vanguard still exists, right? Just because it's disorganized doesn't mean that it's not there. Um, and for our purposes, we define the vanguard as the most active part of the working class. And that exists regardless of the level of organization, right? So that section of the working class that is in movement, that is combating capital, that is fighting back, um, that is either organizing workplaces or active in anti-racist, uh, anti-oppression struggles and so forth, that's the vanguard. So where do we go to meet these people, right? If we can't just go to the labor party and try to pick off the left wing, um, this becomes uh, an important strategic question. And this is where we're gonna start sort of transitioning from discussion of ideas into short-term prospects, which just so you know, I'll be addressing a little bit more than the long-term prospects, um, but that's what the discussion can be for. So labor organizing is increasing in recent years. We've seen the, the, the teachers, the, the red state rebellion of teachers. We've seen um, rapid increase in Starbucks unionization efforts and the Amazon union. Um, but on, on from a historical perspective, we're still at a low point in labor organizing. Um, I think there's a lot of hope in some of the new efforts, right? Some um, people we should, of course, be trying to relate to. But as an overall perspective for where revolutionaries should go, I don't think our number one priority or our best chance to meet the vanguard of workers is in labor organizing right now. Um, and that's because the emerging leadership of social movements that we've seen, and especially those social movements themselves, are more combative than the unions, right? If you think about the George Floyd uprisings in 2020, that was to me, at that moment, the vanguard of the working class in the United States. And I think we can tell a lot about left-wing organizations based on whether they prioritized engaging with the George Floyd rebellions or not, right? Um, there, there has not been in my lifetime um, any union activity in this country as energetic and as confrontational and as combative and as radical as, as those uprisings. Um, so, in terms of a working class perspective or a communist perspective on the working class right now, that's 
overall going to be our best chance to meet the vanguard, right? To try to, to meet the most advanced workers that we're trying to relate to. I, that does not mean that we shouldn't be involved in union work. I'm involved in a union drive in my workplace right now myself. Um, so of course, wherever we are, we should be involved in whatever's going on. But when we're thinking about where's our main audience, I think we're looking at social movements, um, regardless of whether these take place on the shop floor or not. Um, and Armstrong makes, uh, demonstrates a good example of this when he's talking about student organizing. Um, and I'm not gonna argue that we should prioritize student work necessarily, but I think that the, the way that Armstrong kind of walks through why organize on campuses for socialist alternative in Australia um, is a good, is a good um, demonstration of how we should be thinking about these things. Where are the opportunities to organize? Where are people that we can really work with um, and recruit and win to socialism? So what is the role of politics in organizing? This is a question that seems on its face slightly absurd, <laughs> right? Uh, we're organizers, of course we have politics. Um, it is in fact, as I think many people here know, much more contentious than that. Um, there was, you know, one of the things that led to the formation of Firebrand was a split in a previous formation around what role politics should play in organizing, right? So we should, we need to be clear about this when we're making our, when we're forming our perspectives. Um, so I'm gonna talk briefly about two approaches that I think are a dead end. And the first is um, where your political tradition is prioritized over organizing. Um, I'm not gonna get into specifics, but we can think about groups in the past that have, um, especially some of the uh, Trotskyist groups that survived after World War II, um, falling into this trap through combination factors, right? So you're maintaining a focus on the correct line, often in the form of an extremely detailed program, these are smaller groups with a high level of theoretical development required for membership. This usually takes the form of a discussion group, right? More than, more than anything else. Um, the flip side of this approach um, is what I'm, I'm characterizing as organizing being prioritized over any kind of political tradition, right? And often this is a reaction to the first problem. People see groups that are isolated, that are sectarian, that kind of fetishize their own history. And they 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 overcorrect into jettisoning any kind of value in a political tradition. Um, some of some uh, comrades in a group that we've worked with before uh, called Tempest will advance something like this in in uh, sometimes referring to it as the laboratory of the streets. Right? We need to see what the streets come up with. Right? We need to 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 pay close attention to social movements without trying to inject our politics into them and draw political conclusions from the activity of the working class. Um, oftentimes this leads to perspectives that focus on socialists facilitating debates, building broad institutions of the working class. And these are all good things, but if you're doing them without bringing your own politics in, you're doing the work of, of liberals and, and social Democrats for them. Right? You're not contributing anything uniquely revolutionary um, in that case. So then, what should we do? Um, I'm going to make the argument for an intervention, interventionist propaganda group. It's hard to say, but it's a good idea. Um, and this is uh, an idea that they make, or a phrasing that Mick Armstrong advances in, in from Little Things, Big Things Grow. And it's it's a response to understanding where we are right now as revolutionary socialists, right? So we want to focus on recruiting and training cadre. And this is our main activity, I would say, in the short term, is, is recruiting and training a core group of people who, who understand the politics, understand how to talk to new people about the politics, and understand how to organize in social movements and labor work and so forth using those politics. Um, but we don't just want to, training cadre does, isn't just studying, right? We're also looking to participate in struggles as open communists. So we're not kind of hiding our politics, putting on, putting on a, a friendly uh, liberal jacket and marching into um, social movements to try to make the most number of friends, um, which is an approach that is sometimes popular. Um, but what we're doing is, is coming into movements openly, making our points openly, saying how we think the movement can move forward, what mistakes we think the leaderships of these movements are making, um, and trying to win the left wing of these movements to our politics. 
Um, and this is one way of testing our ideas in practice against the experiences of the movement. So yeah, we want to draw conclusions and learn from social movements, and we want to maintain our political tradition, and we have to put those things together. <laughs> those two things have to interact. Um, so we should have firm principles, the basics of our politics, uh, perhaps controversially, I don't think should be flexible. I don't think we should be flexible in the question of working class self-emancipation. I don't think we should be flexible in the question of a relentless opposition to all oppression. What I do think we should be flexible about is our analysis of the situation and the forms that those politics can take when we implement them. We are, tragically, too small to be leading mass movements right now or building working class institutions or getting politicians elected. Um, I don't know if people have followed DSA recently, trying to play some games about forming a socialist caucus in the Senate as though that as though the movement is anywhere near that being anything relevant. Um, so what we can do is work with almost anyone, but retain our independence and our freedom of criticism. Um, so obviously it would be beyond the pale for us to work with um, fascists or probably libertarians even. Um, even if there was some sort of very specific issue on which we kind of agreed. Um, but anybody, you know, liberals and leftward, we should be willing to work in, in coal coalitions with on the condition that we don't dissolve into them, right? Uh, yeah. And at this point I gave up on uh, making the slideshow. So as I go through my last few points, enjoy this picture of Rosa Luxemburg. <laughs> um, so then what, what does that look like, right? What does the organization, the, inter the interventionist propaganda group that we're trying to build look like in practice, right? Um, and I have a few suggestions as to what that should look like, and then that'll lead us into the discussion. Um, one, I think we should be looking to organize around the minimum possible level of agreement that maintains the core of Marxist politics. Um, you know, people who have checked out Firebrand's website will have seen that we have, we don't have a 40 page program, we have a points of unity. It's longer than some points of unity, but it's still a brief document, right? And so what we're trying to do is establish what are the key questions that we have to agree on to work together. Um, and that becomes sort of the, 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 the rigid piece of the organization. Um, on other questions, the groups the group we're building needs to uh, develop clear minority and majority positions. So just because we all agree at the points of unity doesn't we agree doesn't mean we agree on everything else, right? Um, and those disagreements need to be made explicit and need to be discussed um, for the reason that we we're trying to build a democratic organization. I think many of us in this room have been in organizations where some of those debates were kind of hidden from the membership or talked about, you know, at the convention, but not in branches and things like that. So if we're going to have a fully democratic discussion of, of different points of view, we need to have clearly established positions within the organization. We need to be okay with those disagreements existing, right? Um, I would, the example that we often use, but I, I'm going to use now is, is what was the character of the USSR? In the past, this is an important question that organizations need to have total agreement on in order to act. It's now a historical question. So I think I think um, you know there are people in Firebrand who would maintain that it was state capitalist or that it was a degenerated worker state, and that level of disagreement on that question now is fine, right? I think that we can have tactical disagreements um, and so forth. And what all this is to say is that we need to build democratic institutions or a democratic organization rather. Um, we need fully transparent leadership and we need to develop a culture of cadre development. And cadre development, um, as I'm using it, is not training new members to agree with the things long-standing members say. Um, if we wanted to do that, we'd have a much easier task. <laughs> um, what we want to do is build an organization of people um, who can advance their own positions, who've mastered the politics, are capable of organizing around them. Um, and to do that, you have to have all of the conversations, all of the discussions and debates in the organization, whether it's political, historical, tactical, in terms of what to do in movement work, um, happen throughout the organization. Um, and if we can do that, if we can, if we can develop a national organization of, of vibrant local chapters, um, that begins to grow on that basis, this starts to expand 
both our understanding of what the situation is, right? The more people from more movements and workplaces we recruit, the better we understand what's actually going on on the ground. Um, and that feeds into and reinforces our ability to actually organize around the ideas of the tradition of revolutionary socialism um, and build a party in the future that might just be capable of taking down capitalism. 